Hello, tonight I want to talk to you about Build 36 and Build 37 and what the difference is and why you should or shouldn't care about it. Um, to even begin to tackle this problem, we're going to need to first understand what a build is. Uh, perhaps you may have seen reference to Build 36 or Build 37 on Family Tree DNA or on GEDmatch um, or on Borland Genetics uh, or to Build 38 on SNpedia. And if you've never heard of uh, SNpedia, that's okay. We're going to mention it briefly today, but we'll, we'll cover it in a lot greater detail in future editions uh, in this video series. But to get to the point, um, when you hear these terms, we're referring to sequential versions of the accepted map of the human genome uh, agreed upon by the scientific community or, or a subset of that scientific community called the um, Genome Reference Consortium. Uh, each build represents a refined understanding of the sequence of the base pairs along our chromosomes. A loose analogy to build versions would be the sequential additions of the Rand McNally Road Atlas, uh, but with one major difference. When Rand McNally publishes the subsequent editions of their atlas, uh, they generally, generally do so because the network of roads has changed in some way. You know, maybe new roads are built or uh, existing roads are modified or I, I guess old roads are destroyed or uh, don't think that happens too often though. Um, However, when we talk about subsequent builds of the human genome, the difference from the previous versions are not characterized by changes in you know, the actual geography of the chromosomes, but rather reflect a better understanding, a refinement in our understanding of where, where our genes are located along our chromosomes and have been located all along. Nothing has changed in, in fact, it's just our understanding has changed. So a better analogy might be if Rand McNally did a, a roadmap of, of an atlas of Mars, and each subsequent version was based on clearer photographs uh, as the ability uh, to photograph the planet improved over time. Um, build, uh, build 37 of Rand McNally's atlas of Mars would therefore represent like the 37th time uh, their cartographer has decided that improvements in the technology warranted re replacing the previous version or build with an uh, entirely new set of maps. Um, when Rand McNally releases a new version of their atlas, they're also uh, going to have to change the index because maybe their cartographers uh, discovered that a ridge of the Medusa Fossi, that's a giant series of trenches on the planet, uh, kind of like our Appalachian Ridge and Valley region in, in the United States here, uh, if, if, if Ridge 1 or if the Ridge was on the map at grid D16, but refinement, you know, shifted things a little bit, uh, it may need to be re-indexed uh, and, and the, this uh, feature may now appear on E16. So they've got to re rewrite the index um, based on the higher resolution images that have come out of the planet. Um, if you really want to be technical, it's it's more like the the previous images only showed eight ridges, uh, and the new clearer image showed ten. So the ridges themselves need to be renamed on the map. So they were previously named from west to east. Maybe ridge one gets to keep its position, um, but all the way to the east, ridge eight has to be renamed ridge ten um, to fit in these new ridges. And maybe somewhere in the middle, like ridge five, gets renamed ridge six. Um, if you're keen on math, you could refer to this as a, a differences between the coordinate systems. Uh, if not, don't worry. Uh, but you might see that terminology used sometimes, and it doesn't mean much. It doesn't add much to the conversation, too. But we commonly refer to it as build 37 coordinates or build 36 coordinates. And, and I like to use that terminology too because it's kind of precise. So when finances are tight, maybe you can't afford Rand McNally's. 37th Atlas of Mars, so you'll just rely on the 36th edition that you have in the trunk. And uh, what's going to be the consequences of that? Well, very similar to, you know, their Atlas of the Earth. You'll probably be fine on your journey. Um, if you're traveling in the west parts of the region, you'll be fine. Uh, but it, you might run into uh, some issues and maybe miss your exit if you're navigating the eastern uh, portions of the range. If uh, you're using the Build 36 Atlas and the exit signs, have already been converted to build 37, um, then you're in a little bit of trouble maybe. Uh, I, th I think you've got it now, so let's move the discussion, move the discussion forward uh, to the builds of the human genome and how that applies to practical genetic genealogy. First, let's get, a, get an easy concept out of the way. 
no currently popular popular genetic tools or uh, genetic websites uh, or software that I could think of, and, and I've been known to dabble, uh, indi indicate their results in, in, in builds 1 through 35. Uh, nor do they accept uh, build one, thir 1 through 35 coordinates or input or, you know, give you your raw data in build 1 or build 2. You don't have to worry about any of those. You could think of those as like historical atlases for our purposes. Uh, they were important and revolutionary at their time, uh, but the Tim Hortons currently uh, located on Medusa Trench number eight. You know, it's 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 number six. It's on exit. It's at exit six in the build 36 map, but it wasn't even built yet when they had builds one through 35. So we could just totally ignore those builds for for practical purposes when we're doing genetic genealogy. Yeah. Um, so we're only going to consider using builds 36 through 38 uh, if we're attempting to navigate our chromosomes for modern purposes. The next big concept is that whenever a website or tool gives you segment data or asks you to input or transfer segment data, you need to know, or the website or tool needs to know, in which build coordinates the start and stop points on your chromosomes are being reported. Otherwise, depending on what page of the atlas, you know, which chromosome, uh, and where on the map your segment lies, towards the west or towards the east, you might be providing inches uh, while the website uh, or tool may be expecting centimeters. I'm not talking about centimorgans. I'm strictly making, sticking to our analogy here. I guess maybe it should be miles and kilometers then. Uh, on sites like DNA Painter, uh, where you are not prompted for build information, you might unknowingly be providing some segment data, say from 23andMe, uh, that's measured in kilometers, you know, build 37, and some data from family tree DNA that's measured in miles, build 36, and expecting your results to make sense, and, and, and they won't necessarily, and it'll depend on some things that we're going to talk about. Um, of the major genetic genealogy tools in the market right now, only GEDmatch has some features where you can work in build 38. Uh, they also provide data in builds 36 and 37, uh, but their default is, is, is 37. And the website SNpedia, sort of a Wikipedia of the human human genes, uh, refers to build 38 positions unless you go back in the, each article's history, and then you can do that if you need to, if if you if if you need to convert. Uh, all other players in the market continue to use either build 30, 36, or 37, or both, and that's probably not likely to change soon, uh, as any anticipated benefits in terms of accuracy or anything like that and matching are, are going to be pretty small and far outweighed. Uh, by the cost of overhauling and converting the data and rewriting the algorithms. So now that we know we only have to worry about builds 36 or 37 for the most part, let's talk about where it makes a difference. First off, let's talk about raw data transfer. As far as providing users their DNA, their, their raw data uh, in a file, all sites with the exception of family tree DNA exclusively provide build 37 data. So that's what you're getting. And FTDNA instead provides users with a flexible and maybe confusing uh, options. And, and they allow you to download build 37 data, but they also allow you to build uh, to download build 36 data. And they'll ask you whether or not, you know, concatenated or what, and concatenated just means whether or not you want to include the X chromosome. And you always do. I can't imagine, uh, well, I mean, the site's been around for a long time, but with the other places you're going to be uploading to, um, or whatever you're going to be doing to your data, um, you're going to want to download in build 37 concatenated period. Oh, I mean, GEDmatch may still up, uh, accept build 36 concatenated, but they also accept build 37 concatenated. I mean, that's 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 the gold standard. Uh, when it comes to raw DNA, build 37 is king uh, in the year 2020. So let's move on to segments. Uh, tool suites like DNA GEDcom that gather segment data from the various test, uh, testing company and they gather match data and uh, compare them. Uh, they form their clusters and perform their analysis using genetic networks that have nothing to do with build. They don't, they don't rely upon build. Uh, and I think DNA GEDCOM may have some uh, feature coming out or genetic family may uh, with a chromosome browser. So they're going to have segment data. But when it's doing these cluster charts and things like that and the, the primary tools uh, they're not relying on build whatsoever. They're not relying on exactly where the segment starts or, or finishes. And even if they are, they're only comparing one site at a time. And within the sites, every site's consistent. You know, uh, even though a family tree DNA may be providing build 36 data, it's always providing build 30, 30, 36 data, so there's no big deal. 
Some sites like DNA Painter and Borland Genetics, however, allow for cross comparisons of segment data in some form or another. Uh, and each of these sites takes a different approach. With DNA Painter, you are in total control. You're not even prompted to as the build number. And if you want to keep track of it, and, and you should, there, there's a place to put it. I mean, you, they have provide like a notes field or like a, a caption, I guess you'd call it, um, underneath the title of each phase map, underneath each chromosome map. And please put which build you, you used in there so you remember because you may use that map for something later, which uh, requires you to know which build. I will illustrate the results of inconsistency, what happens if you're inconsistent in just a minute. Uh, but let's just talk about the testing companies and websites that provide segment data. 23andMe, MyHeritage, and Borland Genetics, we all report segment data in build 37. Family Tree DNA reports segments in build 36, as did the classic GEDmatch, which is pre-merger of the GEDmatch Genesis and GEDmatch, if you don't know what I'm talking about. It's, you probably haven't been using GEDmatch that long um, because it was a big deal. Ancestry takes an aggressively prudent approach to segment analysis, um, and it simply just refuses to provide any segment data whatsoever to its customers. Um, they rely upon it for, for tools within the site. They just are private, uh, and they just refuse to provide that data despite years of complaints from customers. The new post-merger GEDmatch gives users the option to select between builds 36, 37, or 38 for output. But uh, build 37 is the default, and that's what you're going to want to use. Um, Borland Genetics prompts the user to choose between build 36 or 37 when you provide the segment data, but it'll always spit out uh, build 37 data when it's you know, displaying uh, matching segments and things like that, or reconstructed segment lists. Uh, and it'll automatically, Borland Genetics uh, automatically makes the necessary conversions at the time when its reconstruction tools are applied within segment boundaries. So it, it, it'll convert as needed. Um, uh, I'll get, uh, there's a, something, a new feature called the phase map block. We'll talk about that in a minute, which is a little bit different uh, paradigm. But Okay, so what if we are not consistent? Uh, or to paraphrase, to put it a different way, what if we create a DNA painter chromosome map and then use some segments from family tree DNA and some from 23andMe? I see a lot of people do that. Uh, or what if we select the wrong build in Borland Genetics when we're uploading and then we try to extract segments corresponding to the ancestors we've mapped out and you know we, we told Borland Genetics it's build 36 and it's really build 37. Short answer is that it will depend on which page in the atlas we're looking at, like which chromosome and uh, how far west to east along the chromosome our mapped segments fall. Uh, I'm going to show you a chart here that illustrates the maximum degree of divergence on each chromosome according to my calculations. So if you're mixing and matching builds on chromosome 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 10, or the X chromosome, all those things that I marked green there, it's not going to be a big deal. Um, but if the goal is to create super accurate, you know, reconstructed ancestors using Borland genetics, it pays to be consistent. I mean, you're going to get better results. You're going to run less of a risk of matches being split up uh, across a border. Um, so chromosomes marked in orange will cause you minor problems when mixing and matching builds. Chromosomes 1, 15, 17, and 19 will be completely wonky. you attempt to compare apples to oranges on the east side of chromosome 19, for example, uh, it says there are 4.7 megabase pairs as the off offset, uh, and that will result in a ma major discrepancy. That portion of the chromosome also has a very high recombination rate. So it turns out that 4.7 megabase pairs at that east tip of chromosome 19 corresponds to almost 20 centimorgans. So that's to say, if you use build 36 coordinates for a uh, sizable, a nice 20 centimorgan matching segment with your match uh, at the east tip of chromosome 19, and you compare it to an identical segment recorded in build 37 coordinates, uh, when you enter the segment data into DNA Painter uh, for each of the two segments, they're not even going to appear to overlap, even if you uh, inherited them from the same ancestor. Um, 
So if you want to make an accurate map that includes both FTDNA and 23andMe segments, you're going to need, to con you're going to need an app that converts them. And Borland Genetics has a free app that does that, although it's kind of uh, in its early stages. You can cut and paste from Excel and I think GEDmatch, uh, uh, but it's having some issues with Google Sheets and things like that. So it's under the new free tools menu on the tools tab at Borland Genetics. So let me, let me explain that again one time, though, because it's really important. If you're on the far right side, the east tip of chromosome 19, and you've matched, let's say it's the same person you match on chromosome 19, and it's a big, nice 20 centimorgan match, um, and you match them on family tree DNA, and it says 20 centimorgans, and you say, wow, I'm going to put that in DNA Painter, and then you match them again, and 23 and me, and you and, and if you compared that in in DNA Painter right by side by side, they're not even going to look like they overlap because the offset is so big at the end of chromosome 19. And uh, other some of the other chromosomes, like I say, in one and 15 and stuff, they're they're almost as bad. Um, so for sake of completeness, the Borland Genetics Phase Map Locker uh, it allows you to store your, your phase maps, uh, whether you can create it, created them in Excel or on Borland Genetics or or DNA Painter. Um, and it allows you to upload data from DNA Painter and either build 36 or build 37, but it makes you tell it. Um, and then when you go to download it later, it, 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 it's not going to convert it. It just, it just uh, spits it back out to you however you put in the data. But when you apply these phase, map, phase maps and any of the reconstruction tools in the Borland Genetics site, it's going to automatically apply the, you know, apply the map uh, to the work, reconstruction workflow. It, it'll make any necessary conversions uh, on the spot. Uh, assuming that the user properly designated the, the build when the map was first uploaded, it'll, it'll use the correct coordinates when defining the segment boundaries that it needs to do the reconstruction. If you got lost anywhere above trying to make sense of the technical details, don't worry. As long as you understand the following principles of genetic genealogy, you will be ahead of the pack, no doubt. And number one, build 37 is king of everyone except FTDNA, but they still, they still, uh, you know, they allow downloads in Build 37. They just are reporting their segments in Build 36 for some reason. Um, number two, don't cross the streams. Use Build 36 or use Build 37, preferably Build 37, uh, but never both. Uh, just don't even ask, don't cross the streams, don't do it. Um, for raw, number four, three, for raw data transfers from FDNA, FTDNA, you will always select build 37 concatenated. You will never be led astray if you do that. Don't select anything else. Um, build 37 concatenated. Uh, number four, don't get off at exit six and expect to find a Tim Hortons. Uh, they have since renumbered the exit to number eight uh, back when Canada switched to the metric system, um, especially on chromosome 19. All right. Well, uh, good night and uh, talk to you soon. I hope you found this useful and uh, you can subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, if you did, I'm going to be posting a lot more videos very frequently. If you have any questions, also, please put them in the comments or go to the Facebook uh, users group for Borland Genetics and uh, feel free to ask me any questions there or ask, ask any of you know, the people in the community might respond to your questions. They're usually faster than me in responding and they're you know, they've, they've been around for a while and they know, they know the ropes. So, uh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, watching and we'll see you soon.